Eastman, who's a web dev and security consultant with Coordinates. First up, giving a presentation on the exquisite or dangerous art of safely handling user uploads. Please welcome Tom. I think I just unmuted that. Can I get a thumbs up? Sound is working. Sound is working. Cool. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, I should start by explaining why I was originally inspired to give this talk. I'm not actually like a hacker or a penetration tester by trade. I'm, I'm, I'm generally someone who likes to build things and likes to help people to build things. So my interest in security all along has been not really born of wanting to be a hacker and breaking stuff. It's more born from a constant crippling anxiety about screwing up and letting everyone down and letting people break into your stuff. So that's not really the healthiest approach. I don't really recommend it, but it is a motivating one. Um, so for years, you know, I've always known that sort of handling user, user uploads in your web app was a bit fraught, a bit tricky, but I mitigated the risk the most effective way possible by avoiding it. Um, just avoid having to do it. More recently, though, I've had to work on projects that require user uploads, either for some kind of data ingest or because they handled images of a certain type. And I kind of made some unpleasant realizations along the way. Getting it right is harder than you might expect at first. So most of my web development experience is as a Python developer using Django. Um, Django programmers in the room? Cool. So Django's got a really strong reputation when it comes to secure web application development. You're pretty well protected from the common security pitfalls that, that you'll end up encountering um, when you're building any sort of reasonable site. Django's got a really strong object relational mapper, and that makes it really difficult to write code that is susceptible to SQL injection. It's got a good templating engine, which provides really strong auto-escaping by default. So it's really hard to write code that's susceptible to cross-site scripting. Uh, but not impossible. Cross-site scripting's a hard one. Uh, and the built-in built user authentication, session management capabilities, CSRF, all those things, uh, Django follows really good secure best practices. It's probably, it's probably best in class. It's pretty hard to, it's pretty hard to pull one over on, on a Django website. My point is with Django, the defaults keep you pretty safe. So like right out of the gate, you're reasonably well protected from most or several of the um, vulnerabilities that are listed in the OWASP top 10. Just quick, quick call of hands. Who's familiar with the OWASP top 10? Awesome. Um, for those of you who aren't, if you're a web developer, I can't recommend strongly enough that you Google that and read the OWASP wiki and read up on the OWASP top 10. It's a biannual list of, um, of the world's 10 most exploited vulnerabilities. And it sounds mean when I say this, but if you're a web developer and you haven't read this stuff, you're a liability to your company and you're a liability to your project. It sounds harsh, but it's fixable. It's, it's, it's something that you can do. It's a Google away, read up on it. You'll know and knowing, I won't go there. Okay. So they aren't all that you need to worry about anyway, but they're a good start. The second thing I learned is it turned out that, sorry, when it, tur it turned out that when handling user file uploads with Django, Django's default settings turned out to be somewhat problematic. It didn't quite, uh, solve some problems for me that I kind of wished it would. They're not insecure exactly, but they're geared towards getting you up and running fast and not necessarily putting safety first. So here's a little bit of code. It's a little bit of Python code that will be familiar to anyone who's written Django before. Um, just to demonstrate how quickly you can set up a file upload. The problem in this example is that behind the scenes, the defaults expect you to be saving the files directly to a location where they'll also be hosted shortly. And I'll be explaining during the course of this talk why that's an extremely bad idea. The other thing I realized is that if you get it wrong, the scope for damage is actually pretty eye-widening. Uh, a little bit of clever manipulation could see files saved to locations that you didn't expect, leading to exploitation of the server. A uh, misconfigured web server could be led to execute code included in user upload files, straight up code exec. A malicious file can cause programs parsing it or validating it on the server to crash or misbehave. And finally, and most important, a lack of care when handling user uploaded files can easily turn your own project or your own site into a platform for attacking other sites and other services and your customers. 
sort of back to that cross-site scripting example earlier. And I think it's fair to say that you, as the developer, have the responsibility to ensure that your work can't be exploited to attack others. So this afternoon, I'm going to give you a short list of concrete steps to help you solve what is actually a pretty complex problem. Uh, in order to explain why each step is a good idea, I'll need to give you a little bit of a, a couple examples of how it can go wrong and what you are protecting yourself from. This is not a mystery show, though. Uh, I'm not going to dangle and tease you with cliffhangers. I'm, I'm here to help you. I want you to get this right. I want all of us to get this right. So I'm going to give you the last slide of my talk first. <laughs> so here's my advice. One. If you don't have to handle file uploads, don't handle file uploads. Outsource it if you can. Two, throw away the entire file name. Never keep it. Lose it. You'll see why. Trust me. Always store any uploaded file somewhere outside of the web route, not where it's immediately going to be accessible to the web server or anyone accessing the web server. You don't save it to slash var slash dub 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 slash whatever. Don't put it in there yet. Always carefully parse and verify the file in quarantine to prove that it's your own, that it's exactly what you expected to have in it. And finally, copy the parts out of that file that you care about into a brand new file that you made for hosting. So, I'm going to spend the rest of this talk explaining why each of those steps is a pretty good idea. And I might make you cringe once or twice along the way. So, in order to explain steps one and two, getting rid of file names and storing them outside the web route, I want to explain something about web server software and about some of the assumptions they've historically made about their threat model. Web servers are probably the most exposed pieces of software on the planet, except for maybe DNS resolvers. Uh, they're hit by requests all day, nonstop. They're hit by legitimate requests, maliciously crafted ones, and just corrupted ones and sloppy ones. By now, Web server software is pretty resilient to malicious input from, outs from the outside. They, they kind of have to be. The problem is that web server software does expect to be able to trust the files it's serving. Back in the day, right from the start, they were built with the assumption that any files that they're serving up, that they're actually you know, delivering to their, to their clients, are there because you put them there. And sometimes they're configured to execute instructions in those files. So just going back to sort of server security 101, right? If an attacker can upload code and get the server to execute it, they win, right? You lose, it's over. If they can, if they can make your server to do what, do what they want to do, you're in a lot of trouble. So let's talk about code executed from inside the web route. What are some examples of code that lives inside the web root that's hosted somewhere in like var slash dub 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 um, that is executed by the web server when it's served? Throw me something. PHP, right? Cool. The most obvious is PHP, but it's not the only one by any stretch of the imagination. Apache has its own server-side include language, CGI scripts, the old-fashioned traditional thing, um, active server pages. You're not necessarily in the Linux world. You might be using ASP. Shoot, ASP works in Linux now, I think. What? Hmm. Um, HT access and configuration directives are in there, and they can have instructions that are executed. And then finally, you know, you might whatever add-on modules you're using in, PH, in Apache or Nginx or whatever your web server, any number of those things could add functionality to that code. If your web server is configured to treat any of these files as special, then an attacker who can successfully upload any of these files into the web root has a way into your system. So I'm going to use PHP as an example in this talk a lot, but this is definitely not a PHP-only issue. It's just that PHP's ubiquity combined with its execution model kind of makes it a very common risk factor, especially for those of us in the Linux world. So let's say you have PHP installed either intentionally or unintentionally, which I'll get to. Um, most default Apache configurations, including Debian's and Ubuntu's, uh, will execute any files requested with the .php file extension as if they were part of your program, right? You request the .php file from the server, the server will execute the file and send you the result. So if you're receiving file uploads, you might think that you need to block any files of the extension .php from being uploaded and saved to the web root. And you'd be right. 
The trouble is the same default configuration, the, ones that's, the one that's installed when you just go apt-get install PHP or apt-get install LAMP stack or apt-get install whatever on Ubuntu or Debian, uh, also runs as PHP any files with these extensions too. This is the default configuration. PHP 3, PHP 4, PHP 5, PHP 6, PHP 7, PHT, and PHPS, and PHTML. So that's the standard conservative configuration provided by distributions. Just app get install, and that's the default. So you need to be checking all of those. And also, I'm not sure if you've heard this, but the internet's full of bad advice. And depending on what tutorial you or your administrator followed when setting up PHP on Apache, they might have used this snippet of configuration file, of configuration code in their Apache configuration when they're setting up PHP. You see this in tutorials all the time. Does this look familiar to people? You've, you've seen this before, right? Does anyone know where I'm going with this? Yes. Oh, you've seen this before, though, haven't you? No. Um, OK, it looks innocent, right? I mean, it looks perfectly reasonable. But it has a feature. It has a great Apache feature that Apache allows you to have multiple handlers and multiple extensions per file. So now, all of these are executed as PHP as well. FileName.php.jpg. It's PHP. It'll be executed by the web server. FileName.php.gif. FileName.php.text.jpg.gif. FileName.php.whatever the hell I want to type.txt. Anything that has .php anywhere in the file name will be executed by your web server. So you can't just be checking the last three characters of the file name, or you'll be heartbroken. So what if you're not even using PHP? You'd, you'd actually be surprised how often PHP ends up being installed and configured on servers that aren't even using it. Maybe it's especially in like a shared hosting environment. But like, for example, on Debian and Ubuntu systems, again, sorry, I use those as examples just because they're the ones I'm, the mo I'm most used to. Uh, if you are installing a fresh server and you say, install the LAMP stack or you know, install sort of a default web dev kit, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a Python dev or a Perl dev, the P will stand for PHP. It'll install mod PHP and Apache for you. Maybe you are writing your own app, but you also have WordPress on there or any number of other things that depend on PHP. You'll end up with it installed as well with that default configuration you saw before. Um, ooh, OK, tell a fun story. Uh, the, this thing. Um, I gave a version of this talk at a Python conference a few months back. And I had a gentleman come up to me afterwards. And he said, I had no idea about the ad handler thing. That scared the crap out of me. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm really glad you got something out of it. And he's like, no, you don't understand. I'm the release manager for PHP. And I had no idea that that was a thing. <laughs> right? See, so, I mean, and, and fair enough, right? He knows PHP back to front. He doesn't necessarily know all the vagaries of Apache. So I was very, I was very kind of pleased that I was able to surprise someone. OK. So as if all of that wasn't enough reason to never, ever trust the file name or extension of an uploaded file, here's seven more. Are you checking the case sensitivity of the extension of your file name wherever you have it? Uh, this is a good one. This is from. Um, <laughs> This is, this is something that would affect old Internet Information Server um, versions where the string that the ASP code sees has JPEG on the end, but when it gets saved to disk, everything gets truncated after the uh, semicolon, and so it gets saved an as an ASP file, and it'll, get, it'll become executable. Are you checking for dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, or any such combination in your file name that's being uploaded? Maybe it'll be saved with that file name, which will just be annoying in your shell thing, but then if you're concatenating strings later in whatever programming language you're using, you're going to have fun. What about combinations of forward slash and backslash? Because Python treats those as interchangeable, I think, on Windows systems as part of its making it reasonably tolerable to do cross-platform programming. Again, with Windows stuff, the old uh, 8.3 file name thing, um, this is um, kind of like HT access files in Apache, and it's, it's actually web.config. And it still truncates with the little tilde one before the extension. That's sort of just an old, um, older versions of Windows servers might get fooled by that one. Uh, files with any combination of single or double quotes could be hilarious. And the, no the poison null byte, which is an old favorite of PHP developers. Which again, you know, the, the C functions that operate on strings, including the ones that probably open and write files to disk, terminate the string at the null character. And it'll save that, even though your string in a higher level language 
will actually treat it as a whole string. And after all of that, you can't even trust the file extension in the first place because users, right? They'll, they'll upload the wrong file extension all the time, the wrong file type. How do you know that the JPEG that's been uploaded is actually, is actually a JPEG, you know, file format? What about .jpe or .jpeg or any of the other variations of the extension that you might have been looking for in the first place? You don't have to be a malicious user to upload the wrong file. It happens all the time purely by accident. Throw the whole file name away. Can't use it. You can't trust it. It's not useful information. You can't, you can't expect it to tell you anything true or useful about the contents of the file. And you can't trust the content type header of the upload request to get it right either because the web browser usually supplies that based on the extension too. And it can be maliciously crafted by someone who's actually trying to do you harm. Throw away the entire file name. If you need it, you can store it in your database, but you treat it as untrusted input just like everything else and you don't let it near your actual file system itself. Name the file something crazy. Name it after an MD5 sum of the contents of the file or something like that. If you're saving it to an ob object store like S3 or something like that instead of the disk, do the same thing. Uh, storing files outside of your entire computer is an extra layer of security that's probably a good idea. It's pretty reasonable if your framework allows you to, to just store uploaded files directly in an object store like S3. Throw away the entire file name. Doing that forces you, forces you, which is convenient, to steps two and three of my plan. So always storing freshly filed, always storing freshly uploaded files in, in a quarantine, sort of outside the web root. You've thrown away the file name. You've removed from yourself the temptation of trusting it to tell you anything useful. So now you actually are forced to look inside the file itself to prove that it contains what you're expecting. If you were expecting a CSV file, you're actually going to have to read the damn file and see what's inside it. If you're expecting an image file, you actually have to use an image file parser to prove that it opens successfully. So we're all safe now, right? <laughs> Not actually comedically reaching for water, I just... <coughs> nope. <coughs> Apologies. Reading and parsing potentially malicious files is a dangerous game. You don't actually want to be doing it. But if you're going to be serving the files, you have to. Sorry. <coughs> Pardon. The alternative is simply throwing your users under the bus. It's your job to protect them from your website, not the other way around. So the things that can go wrong are as myriad as the types of files that exist in the world. But here's just a couple of examples. A file could straight up contain a virus, right? Standard, traditional, virusy things. Um, a compressed file like an image file can be crafted to blow out your memory when you parse it, like uh, a, ten a 10 trillion pixel black JPEG that compresses down to like 100 kilobytes, and then when you open it, hilarity happens. Who's, who's emailed their friends those sorts of files before? <laughs> not me. No, certainly not. Um, any XML or XML-based file format can have all kinds of nasty things going on to mess with the XML parser. Um, I've given talks on that in the past here. and. That can be fun, too. Um, and that includes things like SVG, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of file formats that are XML-based that you might not necessarily realize are. Um, kind of like the JPEG thing, a zip file filled with 100 gigabytes of zeros. That one's always fun. And actually, zip files and archive files, if you're handling those, then you have all of the above problems all over again in every single entry in the zip file. So the advice I can give you here is kind of limited because what you need to do depends on your individual use case and the types of files you're expecting. You need to be aware of the failure modes of whatever parsers you're using to read your uploads. So with things like XML, you have the problem that they're essentially programming languages in their own right, and the parser is essentially an interpreter. So you need to turn off all the features of the parsers that are dangerous on untrusted input, and there are a lot of them. Um, see, my, see my previous talk, serialization formats aren't toys because I have some fun with XML in there. Um, and with images, it's really, really important to keep your systems up to date and patched because we have a long, long history of terrible security bugs being found in image parsing libraries. Come on, say it. Someone say it. <laughs> um, who's, who's not familiar with image magic? Great. OK, so 
uh, for, for you guys, Image Magic is a very ubiquitous set of image manipulation tools. They're like a lot of handy command line tools that have been around for a really long time and used to be very commonly used for image manipulation in web apps, especially in like CGI scripts and stuff like that. And it's an old code base. About six months ago, a large number of critical security issues were publicly disclosed and patched. And they were worst nightmare scenario kinds of bugs. Like anyone using Image Magic to handle an untrusted image was vulnerable to immediate trivial shell exploitation. It was super easy to exploit. Here's an example. That's all it took. So that's a whole file, which is an image. It's got a little thing there. And then, hey, wait, what's that? Oh, that's actually running a command on the server. And you didn't need to be trying to open to view the image. You could have just been, or rescaling it or anything. You could have just been running Image Magic's identify uh, command, which just tells you that it's a PNG or a JPEG. And that would have been enough to compromise your entire computer. That's simple. No buffer overflows, no stack smashing, none of those crazy C style memory exploits. It's as anticlimactic as it is devastating, right? Like, that, that's too easy. Make, make your penetration tester work harder. <laughs> so anyone who's behind on the security patching could end up being vulnerable to something embarrassingly destructive like that. And you don't know, like you probably have code sitting on your server right now that's as vulnerable as this that we just haven't found yet. When we find it, usually we patch it fast. So make sure that your, your servers are totally up to date. And for God's sake, don't get me started on an antivirus software. Uh, has anyone heard the name Tavis Ormandy? Yes. Yep. Awesome, okay. Follow Tavis Ormandy's feed on Twitter and weep for humanity. Um, <laughs> he, he is a member of, he's an employee of Google. He works for Google's Project Zero and his remit is essentially to find vulnerabilities in open source or proprietary software and let them know about it. He basically is a bug bounty hunter bankrolled by Google to make the entire internet safer. Uh, fun story, a few months back, Tavis Ormandy found a bunch of severe security vulnerabilities in Symantec antivirus. And so he emailed them to warn them about it. Unfortunately, Symantec uses Symantec to scan attachments and their entire email, email infrastructure crashed. So he had a bit of fun trying to just get in touch with them. So if you're actually required to run antivirus software to scan things, and this is actually quite often a business requirement, my recommendation is run it somewhere else. Uh, send the files to a separate server for, for scanning, somewhere, somewhere separate from your app server. And if they're not confidential files, if they're not personal identifying files, send them to a cloud scanning service. Those are actually pretty good. If they're public files. You, you just you don't want to do that with um, anything private. So if that doesn't scare you into uh, scare you a little bit about opening up and looking at random files that have been uploaded to you, I'm not really sure what will. But if you're receiving files from the internet and you intend to host them again, you still have to do this job. Um, it is still your job to look inside them and make sure they're okay. So remember step zero. Back at the start when I was saying like the only winning move is not to play, if you can avoid this, consider avoiding this. If you need profile pictures in your, in your um, Facebook killing new swanky social media app, uh, consider using something like Gravatar. Consider using something that, that outsources the problem for you. Uh, Gravatar is just a, a nice easy way of outsourcing the deal of profile pictures. Um, but yeah. Keep your tools up to date, keep your security patches current, keep your parsers and file ingest mechanisms conservative, paranoid, and stupid. Throw away any files that look wrong. For bonus points, use AppArmor profiles. Has anyone played with AppArmor? This is where I get to dive into a slightly more fancy Linuxy thing. So this might qualify as an extra credits assignment for some, but if you're working in a high-risk environment, then this is worth your time to investigate. AppArmor is a Linux security technology that restricts a program's capabilities. So it's, function, it's functionally equivalent to SE Linux profiles, so you can look into those if you're in the Red Hat CentOS environments. So as an example, you can pretty quickly and easily create an AppArmor profile that says, this program is allowed to open its shared libraries and files in my upload quarantine, but if it tries to open a network connection or start a subshell, kill it and report it into the logs, right? So 
So the image magic example from before, this would a, a decently crafted app armor profile would save you from that, even if you didn't know the vulnerability was there until it was triggered. Because a well-crafted app armor profile might have preemptively killed the image magic binary the second it tried to start a subshell, or the second it tried to make any network connection. This is super relevant because 20 minutes ago, before I came in here to give this talk, I got tweeted at by um, a colleague of mine who was telling me that Image Magic just got hammered by all of this all over again. So as of two or three days ago, there was more code exec stuff in Image Magic found that he was able to use to exploit and establish network connections from other people's servers, which is a no-no. And Something like having a good app armor profile would have protected those people even though they were still using image magic. They would have, the process would have been killed and it would have hit the logs the second it tried to make an outgoing network connection. They would go, oh, you're an image parser. Why are you talking to that server over there? Goodbye. It's, it, it's cool stuff. It's really worth learning about if you're a paranoid systems geek like I'm hopefully turning you all into. OK, so we're finally at step four, copying what you care about into a new file. This is sort of a bit of extra work. It, seem, it, it might be painful, but it's a final safeguard that would protect you and your users from unpleasant surprises. The idea is that you never serve the original uploaded file. You build a new one yourself that isn't a straight copy of it one way or another. Uh, the most simple example of this, the most obvious one, if you're talking about image files, is once you validated that the image file is actually a JPEG, um, recreate it. You're probably going to rescale the image anyway. You might scale it down to a thumbnail. You might be resizing it. Some sort of transformation like that where you're creating a new file out of the old file and not preserving things in the new file. I'm uh, sorry, in the old file. That could be really, really valuable. There's, or converting it to another format entirely, converting it from JPEG to PNG, converting it from doc to PDF, you know, something, something like that. There's two goals that you achieve by doing this. The first one is that we guarantee that whatever we're hosting, we built. We're the ones who built that file. We know that it has all the data that we needed, that we needed to serve back up to them. And we know that it probably doesn't contain any surprises because we might have accidentally clobbered any weird corruption that might have turned out to be an exploit. And we've thrown away everything we don't know about or care about. So JPEG files, again, make a pretty good example. By tampering with the image ourselves, we might break any malicious content that might have been in there that wasn't aimed at you, but was aimed at your users. So um, what are some names of the lovely exploits that have hit both iPhone and Android image parsing libraries recently? Stage Fright hit Android, and iPhone got hammered by something quite nasty recently as well. But I, sorry? Something with tips. Yeah, well, it's always something with tips, isn't it? They're, they're tricky. But um, an exploit that is being uploaded to you might not be about you. It might be about your users. So you could inadvertently destroy an exploit that was destined for someone else. And there's no harm in that. But even putting security exploits aside, it's actually just good data hygiene. So imagine your user is uploading a picture, and that picture contains an EXIF header. And that EXIF header includes like the GPS coordinates of the location the picture was taken. Like that, that's a potential data leak that neither you nor your user might have expected or desired, right? It, it's a tool for doxing, you know? It's a, it's, if there's no compelling reason for the hosted image to have that data, then you should just remove it as a routine part of your upload processing. And you shouldn't even think about it. Like if you, you can always add it back if it turns out to have been a useful part of whatever you're doing as part of your service. Anybody recognize this? This is part of a um, part of a part of a promotional campaign for who was it? Huawei's fancy new P9 smartphone. They were like, look at the amazing quality of the camera on the P9 smartphone. Um, yeah, that is actually a really awesome photo for a uh, phone camera. Um, they posted this on Google+, Plus, and Google+, Plus didn't sanitize the EXIF headers. So because of that, we were able to look and go, hey, <laughs> that is a really good camera on a phone. So 
always be on the side of your user's discretion. So like, don't be like Google. <laughs> um, and we're back where we started. So I hope what I've done is I've just given you some food for thought, some, some useful steps. Even if you just do step zero, then I've probably saved you some pain. Um, take care out there. Always remember to write beautiful code. And always be on the lookout for new ways that you can disappoint bad people. Um, thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. We have plenty of time left for questions, so we'll... Um. Is that me? That's you. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, um, as well as App Armor, would you also recommend, um, if the platform uh, required it or supported it using SE Linux to do the same sort of thing? Absolutely. Um, App Armor is the only one that I've played with myself. So, because most of what I do is Debian or Ubuntu based, and App Armor is pretty specific to those. Um, Docker containers too. You know that that's some kind of sandboxed environment where nothing surprising can happen. So a locked down app armor profile is a good idea for your application in the first place, no matter where it is. And if you're working in a containerized or dockerized environment, there's a lot of great precautions you can take there as well. Um, that's, that's kind of a whole separate talk. But you know, simple things like building Docker images that are read only can go a long way or just restricting their capabilities. So definitely SE Linux. My understanding of SE Linux from what I hear is that it's quite a lot more complicated in syntax, so maybe it'll be more painful, but it's the same kind of mechanism. Uh, yeah, I was um, what, wondering, what are the alternatives to using image magic, or whether they have perhaps a better track record security, or would you stick with image magic and containers of some <laughs> sort? Image magic has fallen by the wayside anyway. It's a bit of an archaic example. Not many things use it anymore in the first place. So if you're, if you're doing PHP development, you might be using libgd. I, uh, Actually, I'd, I'd say image magic's the more, pop, more popular one. Okay, okay. Certainly, uh, I'm, I haven't done much PHP dev, but I've just you know, run PHP apps just like everyone else. And WordPress moved away from image magic a long time ago. Um, if you're building Python apps out of Django, you probably won't be using Image Magic. You'll be using Pillow, the Python imaging library. Um, these tend to have their own problems because image parsing is its own problem. But Image Magic is a great example because it's so vulnerable, but it's already, I think, on the way out. It's, it's rarer and rarer that you'll find it being a fundamental part of someone's architecture. Yeah. So, so graphics magic is that a fork of image magic, or is it sort of, it's it's sort of API compatible? Okay, so that might be worth investigating too. Thanks. Uh, I was just thinking about the sanitization of of content, like ripping out the bits that you want and so on. Um, you might have a file which is unintentionally invalid. And then you might want to give meaningful error messages, like this is what we don't like about this file to your user. Mm. Whereas that might also be a, a clue that uh, to, to an exploiter that this is what you're looking for. What are your thoughts about the balance there between being helpful to nice people and being helpful to nasty people? It'd be worth thinking about how that applies to whatever your individual use case is. So I kind of bounce around examples in this talk, but most of them have been kind of in terms of images and image uploads. And so you would err on the side of usability. And if the image is corrupt, you can explain that the image, you know, oh, this JPEG seems to have some weird stuff in it that didn't render. Hey, sorry, can you, can you try again with a different file? Um, I don't think it would be easy to steer an attacker towards an exploit that works. I, I'd have to think about that a little bit in terms of especially something like the XML-based files. So, so yes, that's worth, con that's worth thinking about when you're designing this for whatever you're designing it for, but it would, it would depend on what you're building. Hey, Tom. Hey. Um, as an end user with no special insight knowledge, it seems like Facebook does most of this stuff pretty well because a lot of their content is handling user uploads. They certainly throw away file names, they resample to JPEG, whatever it is, they've only just added 
you know, gift support, stuff like that. Do you think they are a good example? And do you have any other particular companies that you think do it really well or do it really badly? I was talking to Josh Simmons about this last night because I really want to know what Google does. So someone, someone from Google, I'd love to hear after this talk sort of, I'm guessing, I'm guessing the people who do it really well are treating it, are probably going whole hog with that sandboxing stuff. Because unless they have written all their own image, li um, image libraries, which, heck, I think the stage fright stuff was original on the Android team's part. May, uh, I'm, I'm making stuff up. I, I don't know if that's true. But um, people generally don't want to re-implement image libraries. Image libraries are known to be a cesspit of bugs. They have been for decades. They've been around for decades. It's old code, you know, libpng. JPEGs have been around since like the 80s or 90s. It's all, it's all old code and old tech. So I think the people who are really doing it right must be doing some kind of sandboxing thing to protect themselves from the vulnerabilities that they don't even know about yet. Also, they have the resources to audit every line of code probably. But um, yeah, people, people like Google and Facebook have reached that stage where getting exploited is no longer an option. Talk to talk to some Google friends at this conference about China um, a few years ago, and and how that changed the entire culture inside the company. Um, there was a great talk at KiwiCon about that uh, last year. So yes, they do it right, but you might have trouble sharing. They might not tell you their secret sauce, but it'll be something like that. It'll be some sort of sandboxing to prevent even the stuff that they don't even know about yet from being dangerous. It'd have to be. Are you aware of any tooling for, I mean, we'll pick on images as an example. Um, if you process an image with a lot of libraries, you might strip the metadata, but you might get new metadata saying, processed with image magic 7.0.4. Hmm. Um, are you aware of any tooling to kind of very single-mindedly strip out that kind of metadata? No, but it's got to exist, huh? I'd hope, because um, it seems like an obvious side channel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a colleague, I have a, or a former colleague and a friend of mine who um, has built a, proje a project that scans PDFs, pulls the images out of the PDFs, looks at the metadata for them for, um, thumb for fingerprints of that kind, of processed by Adobe Photoshop version blah, or IP addresses or stuff like that, and he uses it to work out which lobbyists are writing which, poli which policy docs for which MPs. So he actually has a site where, um, I'm not sure if it's publicly published, but he's, he's open about what he's been building. And it's, um, yeah, it's a tool that he uses to scan uh, New Zealand MP policy documents and going, oh, hey, that lobbyist wrote the same one as that one over there and that one over there. Isn't that interesting? I'm sure people would love to know that. Um, so, do your lobbyists a favor and make sure that all that metadata is stripped. <laughs> make Matthew's life a little harder. Do we have any further questions? Going once, going twice. Please join me with thanking Tom. Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs>